Hi there, my name's James. I'm one of the pastors at Campbelltown Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, wherever you are, I want to encourage you uh, to be connecting with other Christians. Um, these videos, they're a great thing for when you're stuck in isolation or you've got COVID or you're away, but they, they don't replace church. I remember that the church is the gathering of God's people. We've been working through a series in John's Gospel, and today I was actually due to speak on John 12, but um, we're going to look at John 11 today instead. Um, I, I really want to encourage you to pause the video, have a read through John chapter 11. It's a long chapter, but have a read through it. Pause now, and um, yeah, I'm going to pray and ask for God's help. Lord, thanks for the Gospel of John. Thanks for this chapter. I pray that we believe that Jesus really is the resurrection and the life and that that would shape the way that we face death. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this week on Tuesday, uh, a dear sister in our church, Brenda Baker, died and went home to be with the Lord that she loved. And if you didn't know her, you, you missed out. She was warm and generous and colourful and servant-hearted. And her death was a great shock. She had been quite unwell, but not, not to the point of death. And in the space of 24 hours, that all changed. You know, death can be so confronting. It, it makes so much of our lives seem to pale into significance. It, it, it changes life irreversibly. Uh, our culture struggles with death, doesn't it? We, if you're watching this and you're a Christian, we're part of our culture. We do these same things. We, we keep death at arm's length, really, until it forces itself on us. We avoid its reality. We, we put it in the realm of fiction. It's something that happens to other people but not to us. I listened to a podcast this week where a famous, brilliant pastor and writer, a guy named Tim Keller, um, who has pancreatic cancer, said that even at the age of 70-odd, when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, he, he realised that he'd, he'd expected to live forever and was confronted with the, rea the reality that he won't. And I think in our culture, as we face death, we often run to comforts, which is really normal, but comforts that numb us to the reality of death. Um, and we can prone to be heartless towards others who are grieving. We, we kind of expect people to cheer up and get on with life. We might give them a few weeks, maybe if we're generous, a few months, but we kind of expect them to get over it, not realising that some griefs we just carry until we die. I think for those of us who are Christians, making sense of death can be really difficult emotionally and spiritually. We, we struggle to see God's good purposes. We struggle to see his goodness. Um, death can seem so pointless. Um, we struggle emotionally. We wrestle with our grief and loss, uh, a sense of loneliness and frustration, even anger and rage. And sometimes in church world, people can feel a pressure to be happy because heaven, you know, like that that fixes everything. And as we look at this passage today, I think it's quite tempting. Uh, we, we might wish that we could have Jesus right next to us yelling, come out to the one that we love who's gone. But he doesn't. And so death feels, because it is, so final. And so it, it might feel a bit strange in light of Brenda's death to look at John chapter 11 where Jesus raises a bloke from the dead. But here's, here's my hope for us in doing this. My hope is that Jesus and this passage will pastor us a little bit and care for us a little bit, especially those of us who are grieving. Um, and for those of us who aren't, my hope is that this will prepare us well to face death and prepare us to care for others as they face death. Now, if you're not a Christian, I hope today you'll be encouraged to consider the difference that Jesus makes to the lives of, of Christians um, and, 
And I hope that you'll be encouraged to, to think about what you're hoping in, in the face of your own mortality and your own death, and that you consider whether that thing really does love you and really does have power to rescue you. So here's the plan. We're going to start uh, with some context. We're gonna, I'm going to race through the, the passage very quickly uh, and point a few things out that stick out in the passage. And then I, I want to show you five ways that Jesus helps us face death. Um, and I, I should say I, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brenda today, mostly at the end of my talk, and I'm doing so with her husband Warren's blessing. And I, the reason I want to do that is because I think her life and her death beautifully illustrates some of the things that I want to share in this passage. Um, but this is not a talk about her, but about her Lord, and I'm convinced she wouldn't have it any other way. So let, let's start with some context. So at the end of chapter 10, Jesus leaves Jerusalem. He crosses over the Jordan. So he's sort of a fair way away from Jerusalem. And chapter 11 takes place sometime after that. So if the end of chapter 10 is in winter and Jesus dies in the Middle East in spring, we've got sort of three or four months. And this, uh, the, these events in chapter 11 are sometime in that period, probably closer to Passover and Jesus' death than to the Feast of Dedication. And the, the raising of Lazarus, in terms of the, the storyline of John's Gospel, the raising of Lazarus is going to be one of the things that especially solidifies the chief priests and the Pharisees' desire to kill Jesus. And it's also important to remember, really important context, is that throughout John's Gospel, John will keep putting together things that Jesus says about himself and signs so that the sign bears witness to who Jesus is and, and what he's saying about himself. The, the signs reveal who Jesus is. And so in this passage, Jesus is going to say, I'm the resurrection and the life. Uh, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So he's going to make that grand claim. And we'll unpack what that means. But he's, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead in order to demonstrate that that's who he is. Anyway, let, let's, let's race through the passage and we'll zero in on a few things and reflect on them later. So at the start of chapter 11, a messenger comes to Jesus and says, uh, Lazarus, your friend, he's ill. Um, they actually say, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So it's clear that they were really good friends. And Jesus delays. He takes his time. There's some conjecture about whether he was one day's journey away from Bethany or three days journey away. It's not really clear in the text. What is clear is that Jesus intentionally doesn't go straight away. So in verse 4, he says this illness doesn't lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And that idea for the glory of God is not so much just for the praise of God as much as it is for the revealing of God. Remember in John chapter 1, John says, We have seen his glory, glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is, this is a revelatory act, a revealing act. And what's even more confronting is in verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. It seems to be the opposite of what you'd expect. You'd expect him to race there. Um, now some translations actually sort of smooth out that so at the part of verse 6. It's very helpful to see it there because Jesus' love is motivating his delay. His love is motivating his delay. Now, this next section here, we see that there's some concern about death for the disciples. Like if they go back to Judea, where there's people trying to persecute them, they might end up in trouble. And Jesus' words in verse 9 and 10, he's really saying to them, well, it's not night time yet, so we're okay. He's really saying it's not my time to die. And then they get back to Lazarus. It's clear that Lazarus has died. And Thomas, it's helpful to see in verse 16 that Thomas is a guy who really gets a bad rap. He's doubting Thomas in John's Gospel. But here he's quite bold. He's ready to die for Jesus. Now, when Jesus arrives, Martha gets there and asks this question. I think if you or I had been Martha, we'd, we'd say the same thing. 
She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she's right. He, he could have been there and healed her. But as readers, we know from the end of chapter 4 that Jesus actually has the power to heal someone without being there. Jesus healed an official son from a long way away. He just said, it, you know, it'll be. They'll be healed. The person believed. They went back. They found their child well. So Jesus actually doesn't need to be there. And so they have a bit of a theological conversation. Martha kind of misses the point of part of what Jesus is saying. When he says, your brother will rise again, she thinks he's talking about the end of the world. And I think Jesus is talking about the end of the world, but also in that moment, he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And that's where you get Jesus' famous statement, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Um, and, and really what Jesus is saying here is, he is the one who will raise the dead at the end of time, but also he is the one who gives eternal life. And remember in John's Gospel, eternal life is life that starts now and goes on into eternity. Now Martha goes and tells Mary that he's here, gets Mary. Mary asks the same question, a little bit less detail, but Lord, if you had have been here. And... A whole, people, whole lot of people follow Mary, so there's a big crowd there. It's worth knowing that um, in first century Jewish culture, they would have, uh, even a poor family would have at least one professional whaler or mourner. We know that this family was pretty wealthy, so they probably had quite a few musicians and people crying. And when Jesus gets there, we read these words, Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. We've got that again in verse 38. He's deeply moved. The, the Greek word there is actually a word that's often used of an angry, snorting horse. But when applied to people, deeply moved sounds like he's grieved. And I think he is. But, but really the connotation of the word is actually one of outrage. Um, his tears are tears of sorrow and anger. And it's worth asking at what, like at what is Jesus angry? Some people think that he's angry at the unbelief of the crowds. Uh, maybe. I mean, it says there in verse 36, the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? But I, I don't so much think that that's a verse of unbelief. I think really what's going on here is there might be a bit of, outrage at the unbelief, but I think more than anything, it's about sin and sickness and death. It seems that Jesus's anger and grief are mixed together in his tears. He's, he's clearly moved by love for these people, and he's outraged at the reality of death that's invaded their life. And so Jesus gives instructions, roll away the stone. They say, don't do that. It's going to really smell. And then in verse 40, he prays that God's glory will be revealed, that people would see Jesus for who he is. And then he raises Lazarus. We're not really told about the response of the crowd, except in verse 45, that many believed, but that others, well, they just determined to have Jesus killed. Now we're going to zero in on a bunch of things in this passage, but I... I I want to show you five ways I think this passage helps us face death. Um, and so here, here's the first one. I, I think Jesus helps us face death by he, he validates our grief and our anger. This idea that Jesus was outraged, deeply moved in spirit, greatly troubled, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, he weeps at the tomb, and yet he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. You'd think he'd walk up with some swag. Say, so guys, what are you crying about? It's fine. Don't worry. I've got this. But, but he doesn't. Um, I think it's pretty normal for us as humans to feel a huge range of emotion in the face of death. Uh, when, when someone we love dies, sometimes there can be pressure for Christians to celebrate and pretend it's not tragic. And whilst death is something we'll all experience unless Jesus returns, death is still wrong. It's a result of sin entering into the world. It's, it's not part of God's original design. It's right that we feel death's wrongness. 
And it's important to notice in this passage that Jesus is actually okay with Mary and Martha saying to him, things could have been different if you were here. I mean, they're obviously so, so upset. But I also wonder whether there's some accusation in their voices. Maybe a little bit of anger. Maybe a bit of resentment. And yet at the same time, there's faith in what they say. They're recognising that Jesus had power to change the situation. And I love that Jesus is so tender with them. But all of this is to say, if Jesus, as he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, experiences deep, intense emotion at the reality of sin and death and the pain that it causes in the world, then we too, it's okay that we feel those similar emotions. I really want to encourage us to be, to be gentle and patient with ourselves and with each other. I want to encourage us to not pretend like death is okay. Jesus doesn't. The whole reason he enters into this world we saw last week is that we might have life and life to the full. He comes to kill death. He comes to conquer death. And so as we live in a world with death, it's okay to feel all of the emotions that we experience. And it's not an act of faithlessness to be angry, to grieve. Now, part of living life in this, in this world is learning to live life with a broken heart. So here's the first way Jesus helps us face death. He, he validates our, our grief and our anger. Here's the second way I think this passage in Jesus helps us to face death. Jesus helps us to imagine God's good purposes. Why can be a really haunting question, can't it? Often in the face of tragedy and death, we ask why a lot. We think that if we just knew what God was doing, then we could cope with it. But because we don't know, we find it hard. And so much of life and death in this world really is confusing. And these, these sisters, they're, they're confused. They ask their whys. And I think it's worth pausing for a second on verse 5 and 6. Have a look with me again. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. It's clear from later in the passage, he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. And they're like, oh, if he's sleeping, you'll be fine. And he says, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. It's very confronting. I mean, this makes sense in the broader context. Jesus is wanting to raise Lazarus from the dead and help them see something about himself that they haven't yet seen. But for us, seeing this passage that Jesus, because of his love, stays away, because of his love, allows Lazarus to die, it's hard for us in our circumstances to see God's loving purposes in the face of death. It's important to say like, we're, it's right and biblical to lament and to complain, uh, to ask God our hard questions. Jesus isn't put off by that. But this passage does help us to imagine a little. Like Martha and Mary must have felt so unloved as they waited and waited and waited. They didn't have text messages or phone calls. They're like they just, where is the master? When, when is he coming? And yet Jesus did love them. Uh, it's often pretty common to hear from Christians who say that it's in their times of deepest sorrow where God felt nearest, uh, where he felt closer and relationship felt sweeter. Now, I know that's not everyone's experience. For some people, they just feel like God has abandoned them. But I want to encourage you to see that as we face and grieve death, God hasn't taken his love away. In this passage, we see it's possible that Jesus' love for them means that he allows them to experience pain for a greater glory, for a, for a greater joy to come. I'm certainly not saying that we experience pain in order that in four days' time, our loved one might be raised from the dead. It's certainly possible, but very unlikely. Very unlikely. 
but rather I am saying that God wants to reveal more of himself to you in the midst of your sorrows. He wants us to trust in him afresh. He's, he's working good purposes, even in the hard things. And so keep your eyes open for his grace. And I realise this is deeply challenging. For many of us, it's way too soon. But maybe in a few weeks or a few months or even a few years, let me encourage you to imagine that God's loving hand is at work, even in the worst of tragedies. So how does Jesus help us faith death? He validates our grief and anger. He helps us to imagine God's good purposes. Here's the third one. This is probably the biggest one. He promises life. Have a look with me at verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So some Jews, not all, but the Pharisees certainly did. The Sadducees didn't. Many of the Jews believed in a final resurrection. And so passages like uh, the last chapter of Daniel, Daniel 12, seem to speak of the dead being raised. Um, and so it seems that Martha is thinking about that end time resurrection. And so when Jesus says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life, he's saying that end time resurrection that you're thinking of, that's actually about me. He's saying I'm the one who will raise the dead at the end of time. Uh, but he's, he's saying more than that because I'm the resurrection and the life. What is resurrection except life? Is, is that a bit redundant? Is he saying the same thing? I think in that life he's, he's saying I'm the one who gives eternal life, resurrection life now. He's saying that he has power over death, that he'll undo it. And not just in this moment for Lazarus. Lazarus is just a foretaste, a glimpse of, a glimpse of what Jesus will do for all of humanity. He'll undo the power of death. And so the raising of Lazarus later in the chapter is meant to bear witness to who Jesus is, that he is the resurrection and the life. And I, I want to suggest that the life that Jesus offers, the resurrection life that Jesus offers, shines brightest against the backdrop of the darkness of death. You see, it's interesting. In our culture today, talking about the promise of eternal life doesn't really move people so much in Western culture. And I think part of it is because they, they don't actually believe that they'll die. They're... they're they're like, uh, I mentioned that pastor at the start, Tim Keller, who said it's only in the face of pancreatic cancer that he's really realised that he's going to die. And uh, for me, I hear that and I go, oh, gosh, do I really believe what I'm even saying in this moment that I'll die? I think part of my job as a pastor, week to week, is to shake us awake to the reality and finality of death so that we'd actually look to Jesus for hope. Because it's so easy to think of death as something so far off in the future that you don't really need to think about it. And yet a life well lived is one where you're conscious of death, where you use your days wisely. If you're not a Christian, I, I want to encourage you to think, where are you looking to for life? What will give you comfort and hope in your dying days? What's amazing about Jesus is he backs up his claim here about who he is by raising Lazarus from the dead. And even more so later in John's Gospel, after he's crucified, his resurrection really stands at the heart of the Christian faith and, and is the great evidence that Christ is who he said he was. And I want you to notice something. If you're not a Christian, verse 25, I'm the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, whoever Whoever you are, whatever you've done, whether you've ignored God your whole life, whether sometime in the past you've walked away from him, maybe slowly drifting away or maybe in anger turning your back, Jesus says, whoever believes in me, whoever comes to me, whoever puts their hope in me. And this changes everything. You know, Jesus conquers death and offers life to the world. It, that truth doesn't lessen the loss, or take away the grief we feel in the face of death. We still feel it keenly, but it does give real hope and real peace for those who trust in Jesus. It changes our perspective. It loosens our grip on things in this world that we so often try to cling to 
But, but the reality is when we die, we, we lose our grip on those things altogether. All this is to say, friends, trust in Jesus for life, for eternal life, for resurrection life. Cling to this promise. Cling to this promise as you grieve others and cling to this promise as you face your own mortality. It really does make the difference. No one else has conquered death. No one else has ever died and come back to tell us about it. Christianity stands or falls on it. So if you're not a Christian, investigate that. You disprove the resurrection, you disprove the whole thing. But if Jesus rose from the dead, you should bow the knee and put your hope in him. And Christians, don't make the mistake of thinking that death is some far off distant thing that you don't need to ponder. Cling to Jesus today. So Jesus helps us in the face of death. He validates our grief and anger. He helps us imagine God's good purposes. He offers life, eternal life with God forever. I've got two more. Here's number four. He models wise care. I want you to notice that Mary and Martha ask the same question. Martha gives a little more detail, but Martha's question is, Lord, if you'd been here, my... Well, it's not a question. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She adds on, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Mary says the same thing. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And I want you to notice that Jesus' response is really different to these women. So to Martha, they have a conversation. Jesus offers words of hope and consolation. They, they have a conversation about theology, about the end of the world, about resurrection. And he challenges Martha. You know, at the end of verse 26, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. But when he gets to Mary, he just says, where have you laid him? And they go to the tomb and he cries publicly and they notice. And I, I just think it's worth noticing how Jesus cares for these different women in different ways. He's such a good pastor and such a good friend. You know, some of us in our sorrows, we want to ask questions and talk it through. We want to think it through. We, we go to cognitive theological places. Some of us, uh, we think that's just dumb. We want to wrestle with the grief that we feel. We don't necessarily want to have a theological conversation. We just want to know that someone's with us and that they care, that they care, that we're not alone. And Jesus models both a ministry of words and a ministry of tears and a ministry of presence. He obviously knows these women so well that he's able to care for them according to how they're wired. Now, the truth is that you and I will, will by default be good at giving the kind of care that we would want because that's what seems most natural to us. I'm not saying these are the only ways of caring for grieving people. But it is a reminder to be aware that we need to know each other in order to care for each other. We shouldn't be afraid of asking, what can I do to help? What, what would it look like for me to care for you well? Would you like me to do this or this or this or this? Would you like me to just leave you alone? Jesus models wise care so that we can follow his example. And that helps in the face of death. So let me sum up. Uh, Jesus helps us in the face of death. He validates our grief and our anger. He helps us imagine God's good purposes. He offers life and he models wise care. The last thing I, I want to say really is a bit of a conclusion and a summation. It's, it's probably less from the passage and more an outworking of faith. And that is that Jesus helps us to die well. Um, one of the many things that I've learned from Phil Singline is that our role as pastors is to help people die well. Uh, I had a college lecturer who would say that being a pastor is about the cure of souls. Cure is in bringing people to faith in Jesus, but also cure is in preserving them, helping them to follow Jesus faithfully into eternity. And I think dying well really means dying with peace and with hope, clinging to Jesus. Um, Brenda Baker died well. She was sold out on Jesus. She trusted in God. She knew him. 
During her last full day on earth, she shared the gospel with hospital workers. She was surrounded by a family and she told them very clearly that her deepest and greatest desire would be that they know and love Jesus, that they know how much God loves them. And after we read the Bible together and I prayed for her and the family, uh, some of her family members stepped out of the hospital room and she <laughs> looked me in the eye and said, James, come and sit down. I'm going to, I'm going to hold your hand and pray for you. Um, I'm going to remember that for the rest of my life. And in talking to the family after, two different family members have said to me that they saw many people, have seen many people face death in their life, but none of them have faced death like Brenda. They've never seen anything like her peace. They've never seen anything like her hope. They watched her die well because they saw the difference that Jesus made in her life. You see, as Brenda faced death, she really did believe in the promise of Jesus in John chapter 11, that everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And so it's worth saying Brenda Baker might not be with us anymore, but she is certainly not dead. She's in the presence of her Lord. Knowing Jesus, knowing the resurrection and the life changes everything. And so friends, I really want to encourage you today to look to Jesus, to believe in him and trust in him. He helps us feel and deal with our emotions, especially our grief and anger. He helps us imagine and look for his love. He gives life to whoever believes in him. Life that means death won't really kill us. He helps us care for each other so that we might die well. And after this week, that's, that's what I've been praying for me and for us, that we live for Jesus now in view of eternity, that we live with our own death in mind, and that whenever Jesus calls us home, we die with all of the emotions that we would feel, but especially with peace and hope. Let me finish with these words. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's Jesus' question for Martha. That's Jesus' question for you.